Okay, um, now it, it, um, it, so this, this is a lunchtime session for us in the UK, but I'm recognizing, I think, that for, for, for our speakers here, that it's not lunchtime. So let me introduce our panelists, and, and, and they're going to introduce themselves and, and their associations. So, Carmel. Thank you so much, Jane. I'm Carmel O'Sullivan. I'm the chair of the board of CALL, the Council of Australian University Librarians. Um, I am in Queensland, Australia. It is um, not sunny. It is almost, um, it's 11 p.m. So it's close to midnight on Thursday night. And, but right now it's 24 degrees um, in my house. So it's lovely and balmy. Um, so you can feel jealous of me. Might be a little bit late, but um, but it's lovely here in, in Australia. So I'm very happy to be here. Thank you, Carmel. Definitely not lunchtime then. Brett. Thank you, Jane. And um, for me, it's good morning. Um, just outside my window, the sun is just coming up. It's 7 a.m. here in Regina, Saskatchewan, where I am Dean of University Libraries and Archives. And I'm speaking to you today from Regina, Saskatchewan, as president of CARL. Uh, in Canada, we refer to this as the land of Treaty 4, the homeland of the Nahiawak, the Anishinaabeg, the Dakota, Lakota, and Nakota people, and the homeland of the Métis Midship Nation. And today it is, this morning it is a balmy minus 10 here for us, so. Thank you, Brett. Andrew. Good morning from Washington, DC. My name is Andrew Pace. I am the relatively brand new, seven weeks on the job, uh, executive director for the Association of Re Research Libraries. Um, and uh, happy to be with you today. Thank you, Andrew. Masood. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Masood Kolkar. I am here in the capacity of Chair of Research Libraries UK's board. And in my day job, I am the university librarian and keeper of the Brotherton Collection at the University of Leeds in the UK. At the moment, it is lunchtime, or just, just after lunchtime for me, and it is back damp and a bit miserable here in Leeds, but it is nine degrees Celsius, so it's not too bad. <laughs> okay, well, my name's Jane Harville. I am going to chair this conversation today, also add my thoughts towards the end. Um, I am currently the vice chair of UK, but also the university librarian at the University of Sussex, and I haven't checked the temperature, but it's wet on the south coast and feels like we're in a cloud. Okay, right. Um, so we've for this session we we've 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 pulled things together around three topics, um, which which will help I think with with the structure, and and we've asked our panelists ahead of time to to share to think about what their thoughts might be in these three different areas. So we're going to start with strategic alignment and start with what what drivers for engagement what what are the drivers for engagement with the SDGs and, and do institutions see the library as the key stakeholder? So I'm going to start with Andrew and Carmel. Uh, could you kick us off with your with your with your thoughts, please, Andrew? Sure, thank you. I I think the the answer to the very first question about drivers. Um, is pretty simple. The driver of engagements for SDGs, from my perspective, are first that libraries are an international endeavor, as you can see from this, with shared values, shared priorities, and mission. So turning to the United Nations gives us an international framework and a set of standards in which to work, and what librarian doesn't like working from a standard. Uh, the other driver, uh, more pointedly, is crisis, uh, climate crisis. Uh, this is a bit of a digression from SDGs, but I think it's an appropriate comparison. When I came in, uh, I came up in this profession as a systems librarian and, a, and as a product manager. And as we like to say in that field, ideas are cheap. Uh, but there's a simple yet decisive test you can use to determine whether a new idea would be a viable product. So the test is simply this. Is the problem urgent? Is the problem pervasive? And would be would, and would people be willing to pay to solve it? Uh, and I think climate crisis uh, definitely passes this test. Uh, as to the other questions, national engagement, local engagement, are libraries key stakeholders? The answer that ARL has found is a resounding yes uh, to all three from its membership. 
uh, sustainable practices are a priority in everything we do work at work or at home uh, in life in general. And ARL has actually adopted sustainability as one of its values. Uh, however, sustainable, de sustainable development goes beyond environmental sustainability alone. So using the United Nations SDGs as a tool for fostering individual and collective awareness and imagination, ARL held uh, this year its first ever President's Institute uh, in February 2024, sort of an inaugural event for the new president of our board. The, the event this year was entitled Embracing Sustainability, Libraries Leading the Way. Uh, this explored how libraries and museums contribute to sustainable development and how we can build awareness and actively participate in furthering this work. Participants heard from experts in the field and worked together to set sustainability goals for our libraries, our institutions, uh, and also within the Association of Research Libraries. Um, Henry McGee, who is a consultant and founder of Curating Tomorrow, who's actually based in Scotland, keynoted the event and more importantly, facilitated a day-long working meeting that had some very positive outcomes for the group. Um, a lot of the work was centered on his opening challenge to go beyond the cliche, do less harm, and instead not to forget to also do more good. <laughs> um, uh, Henry, Henry has worked primarily in the museum sector, um, so uh, you know, in, in activating SDGs, so libraries were a natural extension to the work that, that he'd already focused on in museums. Um, the day also included a, a panel that was moderated by Bart Murphy from OCLC, one of the event's sponsors, um, Leo Lowe, Sybil Schaefer, Morgan Barker, Sarah Tribblehorn had a lively discussion uh, that actually explored the intersection of libraries, sustainability, and cutting edge technologies. So as you can imagine, artificial intelligence was a, was a big topic, regardless uh, of SDGs being the primary topic. I don't want to repeat what was said at that at that panel, but in terms of is this is this in our lane, you know, our SDGs and libraries lane, I do want to call out the comments that Sybil Schaefer from University of California, San Diego, she spoke eloquently about our lack of attention to digital librarianship and its intersection with sustainability. That you know, libraries are making decisions daily about digital access and digital preservation that will have a long-lasting impact on our digital and carbon footprint. Uh, and these decisions are rarely include consideration of sustainable development goals. Um, the I want to wrap up. The day also included um, some workshops, so it wasn't just sort of a, sta a sage on the stage uh, kind of presentation. They had working working workshops uh, that maybe I can talk about a little bit more as this, this session gets going on. But bottom line is that there was no doubt expressed by the participants that this is an important area uh, for library engagement. Thank you, Andrew. That was very, that was um, very complete and wide ranging. Thank you, Carmel. Mm -hmm. What a great way to start. Thank you so much, Andrew. Um, I did want to say that I'm on Guyable land here in um, where I'm Guyable and Jarrawa land in um, Toowoomba, where I am in Queensland. And I wanted to pay respect to any First Nations people who are with us today um, uh, participating in this session and um, pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. Um, I wanted to, I'm probably a little more tentative, I think, possibly than Andrew. Um, a couple of things that I wanted to acknowledge is that Australia is tracking its progress to the end uh, to the uh, on the UN SDGs, but it's not really a significant driver for the institution. So I think libraries really are more concerned about the SDGs than the institutions that we are within. I would I would think would be a a uh, reasonable thing to say. Um, so uh, in 2019, Call did a, a mapping exercise on the UN SDGs. That was really, again, highlighting individual institutions, individual libraries within uh, higher education institutions, uh, work that they were doing. Uh, more broadly, though, ALIA, which is the Australian Library and Information Association, is probably the primary driver 
of our interest in the SDGs in Australia. Um, and they use the SDGs as the framework for their um, strategic planning. Um, and also for my own institution, so a University of Southern Queensland Library, we've done a couple of mapping exercises and we've produced um, library stories, which are stories of, of what we do individually as an institution um, around the, um, the framework of the SDGs. Um, one of the things that I wanted to um, uh, talk a little bit about, though, was the what what the values and the mission of call is and how they that relates to the SDGs. So sustainability, openness, um, ethics, um, being uh, participative uh, and progressive are all kind of core things to call. Um, so, and we uh, have three services and three strategic programs within our um, remit of, of what uh, CALL does. So we've got an analytics, an analytics service, a content procurement service, and a professional learning service. But the strategic programs, I think, align very, very closely with the SDGs. So one of our main strategic, one of our three strategic programs is around from decolonization to indigenization. And that's really recognizing um, the legacy of colonialism in Australia and the importance that um, indigenous knowledge plays um, and the complex challenges that we face as institutions in Australia um, to effectively address that um uh that space um and the second and third strategic program so open access which is you know about enabling open access to to scholarly communication and then thirdly open education resources both very uh, relevant to the UN SDGs and I'm particularly um, proud of the work that Australia has done and CALL has done around open education resources. So we have a national and an international really, Australia and Aotearoa New Zealand uh, collective around open education resources where we're collaboratively producing free and open textbooks which will in turn reduce the barrier to access to higher education, address um, uh, the uh, inc inclusion um, in higher education, address poverty, those kinds of things. So um, I think, and then the, the last thing I wanted to say by way of introduction is about the university's accord. So this is a new document that's just come out in the last couple of months. So there was a draft accord and now there's a, a final accord, which has a number of um, recommendations for government. And it's really quite a uh, broad ranging and sweeping um, reform agenda. And it, it really tightly aligns. It doesn't mention the SDGs, but it very tightly aligns with the intent of the SDGs really. And it's looking at the significant changes in higher education that are needed to uh, meet our social, economic and environmental challenges, um, the shortage of, of educators, which is mentioned in the SDGs, um, the need for um, uh, uh, environmental and in industrial security, um, the need for sustainability, the need for safety in, in um, the way that we operate as a nation. Um, so that a lot of the things in that accord, and the accord probably is the most important document for higher education in Australia for po possibly a decade. Um, it's it's not it's a it's a recommendation to government so we wait to see how many of those things but it anticipates a very large increase in the number of students in higher education and the diversity of the background of those students and that throws up a lot of challenges for us it also speaks a lot to the research environment and open science and open research um, and probably the last thing I might mention before I hand over is um, is that there's a there's there's also a fair bit of work or or interest, particularly in the media, just in the last couple of weeks in Australia, um, around a 
the infrastructure around open science um, as well. You know, there's interest, there's always been interest from call, but but the mainstream media seem to have discovered um, that that's a thing now. So that's quite interesting. In, the, in a good way, I hope. We hope, yes, I think in a good way, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Thank you, Carmel. Thank, thank you both. I wondered, um, Masood, Brett, is there anything that you wanted to come in on? Uh, I could start. I would say that in Canada, um, at the institutional level, there is support for uh, the SDGs, but it would almost be, from my perspective, in a lot of ways, reverse engineered. So the universities across the country have developed their strategic plans, They've identified what their priorities are, and then they go back and look at the SDGs and say which ones fit this, as opposed to that work necessarily being driven by the SDGs. Uh, so that then affects how it rolls out in individual institutions. So in some cases, as we'll talk about later, there is a great deal of engagement. Um, in other areas, in others, there's probably less engagement. Uh, and for lots of us, I think that reverse engineering continues in the work that we do even within libraries. So we, we align with our institutional goals and plans, and then we identify how that aligns with specific SDGs, as opposed to sometimes having that work um, being driven by that. There are notable examples that I, I'll discuss a little bit later. But I think um, collectively, uh, as in Australia, decolonization is a huge issue for us. Uh, and working with Indigenous and, and Aboriginal people. Uh, and as a result of that, there are things that are going on nationally among libraries that are very much supporting this kind of work. Uh, and I would say nationally among our institutions, libraries probably lead in some areas, uh, but the SDGs are not at top of mind for most of our governments. In Canada, outside of research, the federal government has little um, influence on what happens in universities. And so it's somewhat dependent on our provincial uh, governments on whether where their interest lies. And for some of us, that interest is almost non-existent. And for others, it's, it's more apparent. So I think it's more of a patchwork here, but there is very definitely um, a commitment to supporting the SDGs um, and to moving those things forward collectively and individually. Thank you, Brett. Masood. I think you're yeah, just just building on that, I think there is definitely commitment to SDGs within the UK's government framework, but it's not the most common thing you hear from the government. It's mostly at the moment it's either about immigration or economy or inflation or other elements that are going on. However, I think institutionally, uh, SDGs have been talked about more than potentially in some other parts of the world. At least that's how it feels to me. Um, is it part of our direct strategies, as far as I've noted, um, elements of it are? Sustainability, particularly, is a critical element that features in many institutional strategies. Community and community building is, is very common. And increasingly, library strategies also reflect elements of SDGs. They may not refer to them directly as SDGs, but they are absolutely either directly supporting SDGs or indirectly supporting SDGs. And I'll give some examples of that um, in, in some of the next topics and themes. What's really interesting, and I'll give you a very localized example of this here at Leeds, is about a year ago, we were having a very detailed discussion about what comes after SDGs. And I think this is a really interesting dynamic about, I think we were a bit late the party in terms of SDGs, uh, and I'm saying this as libraries rather than institutions, we've responded to something that's been delivered, something that the institutions are really keen on, and we have potentially more stronger role to play in this. But at least now there is an increasing interest in some SDGs, but also what might come after that and how might we contribute to that. It's not yet fully common, but that thinking has started to emerge. Thank you, Matthew. Um, just I, I want to move on to to to, to what we're doing. Um, but before we do, I just wanted to make a comment around the other. I think both of you, Carmel and, and Andrew, mentioned values. Um, and I and I wonder whether um, in libraries, 
you know, we 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 can we can generally um, sometimes be a bit modest about what we do, but uh, in terms of our values, uh, uh, the I wonder if we can talk. We, we are able to talk very passionately and um, engage uh, with them as drivers rather than checking afterwards, um, uh, be because they because they align so the goals align so closely with our values as librarians. Um, uh, I, I that's a comment someone else can come in if they want to values is one of my favorite subjects um but I was pleased to hear both Andrew and Carmel mention values I agree and I think the the SDGs are very um plain and blunt about what needs to be done and what's not yet done um and I think that uh we could benefit uh, as um as a profession for being kind of plainer and blunter about our values um, and the fact that we're not neutral institutions and that we mm. we do have values. Yeah, lovely. Thank you. Well, let, let me move us on. Um, uh, I wanted to, to in, in, you know, to introduce Brett and to Mas and Masood on, on to talk about their, what libraries are currently doing with, with SDGs. So, um, so how are SDGs and their values being incorporated into, into library strategic, strategic plans, for example? Brett, do you want to start? Sure, um, I can certainly do that. So what we see across Canada is that there is, um, and I will go back to the, what was just said about values. There are, these are respected. Um, they do align with a lot of things that libraries do. And I think what's been exciting to see in Canada is the way that this has happened in many ways organically with because there is no sort of overarching driver behind it. So um, I think that there are some that, there are some of the SDGs that people naturally uh, will align to as what was mentioned before, climate, um, uh, those kinds of things. And, and certainly libraries have looked at that, but I'm going to speak firstly about one of the libraries that has done, I think, the most work in Canada, uh, and that's York University in Toronto. Um, the university itself looked at SDGs as the driver behind the values that they wanted to espouse as a university. Uh, and certainly the library has embraced that. Uh, and I will put into the chat some links for some of the um, reports that they've done. But in fact, by doing that, they've been able to identify that there are a number of SDGs where they can support a number of things happening across the world, um, both and also locally within Canada. And I think it's that sort of commitment and that view that has expanded the idea of where libraries can participate. This has also shown up at the University of Victoria, for example, uh, where the university librarian Jonathan Bankston has um, worked with his staff um, and, ident and actually created a fund where the librarians um, can do projects based on money that was became available through the pandemic, but they have to actually identify which SDGs their work will actually support. Uh, also, at the University of Victoria, there is alignments between individual researchers and librarians, and again, they report that from the perspective of the SDGs that that researcher is working on. So, in fact, it expands where libraries can participate. So, I think we sometimes have this very narrow view of where we can make a, a difference or make a, have an influence, when in fact, by working with people in our communities, we're supporting the advancement of those SDGs. I think nationally also there's been a lot of work collectively in different areas. Shared print is one. Uh, support for open access collectively is certainly one where we have done a lot of work in Canada. But also, given the way that we uh, are licensing for journals is done and support for those kinds of things through the national body of CRKN, our support for SCOS and for third um, for developing uh, nations. Uh, Publishing, whether that's open or otherwise, has also been quite impressive. And so we come collectively together to do those kinds of things. Again, we don't, what we don't do in Canada is then necessarily label those according to the SDGs, which we need to do more of. And I think that's one of the things where, um, as was mentioned, libraries have an ability to actually promote and show what's happening. And we don't always do that as effectively as we can. Uh, in my own institution, we've done an enormous amount of reporting on our use of electricity and computers and how we've changed people's computers and actually adapted our learning commons 
um, to be more responsive to students, but also has reduced our overall greenhouse impact. But I'm going to tell you on my site, on my library's website, there would be nothing that would align that with SDGs, and we need to change that. So I'll turn it over to Masood at this point. Thank you, Brett. Masood? Uh, as, as Brett was talking, I was thinking that there's a potential for a really nice international project here where we all start to collect some of this knowledge, values-driven knowledge that we, or values-driven work that we do and align it around the SDGs. I think it could be quite an impactful report. So um, I'm just thinking about that. Um, I think firstly, I really want to highlight the role of public libraries here as well. I, I recognize that I'm representing academic libraries, but public libraries have done tremendous amount of work in terms of community engagement, in terms of information literacy, in terms of supporting uh, communities from displacement, their backgrounds, etc. And they are all significantly contributing to multiple elements of SDGs. And um, if you read a lot of reports, if you read a lot of research papers around that, a lot of them have been focusing on the role of public libraries across multiple continents. But academic libraries have also increasingly started working on this more actively. And what I'll do is I'll, I'll take three different SDGs and give some examples around that to, to highlight them within the UK context. And let's pick SDG 13, which is the, um, the climate action SDG. And um, as, as Brett was highlighting, increasingly academic libraries are looking at their carbon footprint. They are looking at how their, like I know, for example, in my library, there are still lights that are not LED, that are not controlled in an effective fashion. Um, and libraries are also looking at their 24 seven provision and what's the right balance between student experience, but also keeping very large building open for a very small number of students uh, at 2 a.m. So there are lots and lots of things that are being looked at in terms of the carbon footprint and the carbon impact of running the libraries, but balancing it with the kind of expectations that our students have and our users have at the moment. But it is not just about the buildings. I think increasingly we are also looking at what does it mean to store collections in individual stores? What's the physical carbon footprint around that? Increasingly new projects are being spun up around digital carbon footprint. When we procure a large number of eBooks, what's the overall carbon footprint of that? What does it mean in terms of supply chain? Um, and also I think one area which, uh, which I really want us to challenge ourselves on is how challenging are we with our um, suppliers? Are we actually really pushing them on what their carbon plans are, what their carbon footprints are? And uh, without naming publishers, um, I think some of the big ones have very nice, fancy looking carbon uh, plans on their websites that actually doesn't tell you anything. It just shows their commitment, but no action. And I think there is this level of responsibility, I guess, on our, all of us to start challenging some of that back. In terms of actual examples, I think one particular example I want to give is around British Library. And British Library has been actively leading work in this area. They've recruited a sustainability manager role within their organization, and they have done a significant amount of work in sustainability and carbon reduction features. Um, similarly, many, many other library strategies, and I'm just going to name a few, uh, not complete by any means within RLUK, now include either sustainability or carbon reduction as an explicit metric. And that includes um, British Library, as I mentioned, the University of Leeds Library, Manchester, Sussex, and many, many more. And within RL UK, as, an, uh, as a consortium organization, um, we have signed up to the Green Libraries Manifesto, which showcases our combined collective commitment to reducing the carbon footprint and embracing better approaches to sustainability but also uh, environmental, digital, and financial sustainability all feature in the RLUK strategy itself. One thing that Brett highlighted was the shared collections mechanisms. And at the moment, there is a very strong active uh, project that's running within RLUK around what does it mean to build a collective collection, both from a physical and digital perspective, but also what does it mean to have a, a UK distributed print book collection so that this is not about individual replication and expansion of that carbon footprint, but also thinking collectively how we can reduce some of that. 
I'll pick another couple of SDGs. Um, so apologies that you'll have to listen to my voice for a bit, but let's pick SDG four. It's, it's the one that's really close to my own heart, which is about providing quality education and particularly thinking about communities. And this is becoming increasingly important to academic libraries as their institutions get more and more placed into the civic mission of their cities or their local regions. And I think it's a really fascinating conversation that quite often um, transcends between the globalization and localization of institutional strategy. And I know that international strategy, for example, features very heavily at the University of Leeds, but there's very little which talks about the local region. And yet we are an anchor institution in the city of Leeds in the local region, and we really want to do more on that front. So there is, there's a real interesting dynamic slash tension slash um, aptitude of uh, making an impact that comes from that. But a few examples I want to give within our UK context is uh, the first one I want to pick is Lancaster University Library, who've been uh, pioneering the community card um, offer, which basically provides free access to anyone in the community to their libraries and their collections. Similarly, universities of Sheffield and Leeds now provide membership offer to um, academic asylum seekers and refugees. And there's an increasing sense of we need to work more and more with our local communities who otherwise may not have access to quality education without sometimes having a passport or an ID or all the other barriers that are put in their place. Um, similarly, libraries are also now offering free courses. So free information literacy, free media literacy, free digital literacy workshops. And that's something that's increasing over time. And also the, the, the boundaries or the, the, the layers between academic and public libraries have become more porous. And some academic libraries now also support public library offers from within them. And one example I'll give on that is the University of Aberdeen Library, which has a public library presence and public engagement on that. Bristol is doing some absolutely brilliant work by taking their library to where the local communities are, often deprived communities. So it's not about them coming to the kind of really sometimes very, um, again, I can say this about Leeds, very daunting campus infrastructures. And instead of that, take the library or take the collections where they need to be. And uh, I think that's a really, really strong uh, way of uh, supporting our communities in that. And that in turn also supports SDG1, which is no poverty, because often poverty is linked with lack of access to information, data, and knowledge. So I think these are all kind of really strongly linked initiatives. And one last SDG that I will focus on is SDG 17, which is often the forgotten one because uh, it's about partnerships uh, for the goals. And um, libraries, one of our really core values is collaboration and partnership. And in the UK, um, we, we collaborate very strongly within and we strongly collaborate within the networks like IARLA. Um, however, we've not done this really well beyond the Western sphere. I think we, we look at this from a developed country's perspective primarily. And while that has been an important lens, I think for if we really are serious about global SDGs, we need to think more global around that. And by that, I do mean the way we look at our, how we embrace open access um, so that we don't shift one set of inequities with another set of inequities because we've been looking at it with a very Western lens. Uh, the work that Carmen, uh, sorry, Carmel was mentioning on um, uh, open education, that is absolutely brilliant. And I know this personally that I've seen Australia with a sense of inspiration around that. But that yet hasn't penetrated the UK academic libraries in the same way. There is some pockets of work that's being done, but not entirely in a collective fashion. And I think we need to think about how we contribute more to the institutional partnerships, because several of our institutions have some amazing partnerships in Africa, in South Asia, in other parts of the world. But as libraries, we are not fully activated within those partnerships. And I think that goes back to that political positioning and our own voice around SDGs and what we can contribute, that becomes very, very important. One uh, selfish plug-in for something I will make here is that at Leeds, we've started thinking about it from a knowledge equity perspective rather than an open research perspective, because while openness is very important, openness does not always equate to equitable. 
access, nor does it equate to equitable production. And I think those things are becoming absolutely important, particularly when it comes to indigenous knowledge systems or other knowledge systems that really need to be a core part of solving some of these global challenges. And one really good example of that is how indigenous knowledge systems are absolutely fundamental in increasing the biodiversity and caring for our land. And yet we have not yet fully embraced those in the way we think about certain things. One last comment on this. I think one, one of the things that I was asked was, is there a conflict between what we do and, uh, or is there a tension between what we do in this? And I, I wouldn't say there isn't any, but just going back to what uh, Brett and Andrew and others have said, I think we need to be more direct and explicit about ourselves. We need to be really showcasing what we are already contributing, which will then in turn also highlight where we can do further contributions. The whole SDGs were developed with strong input from the libraries. None of these are actually achievable without quality data and quality information. And there is no one better place than libraries to be those entities of effective, authentic information and knowledge management. So I think we just need to rebuild that perception. We need to rebuild our position around that and remind everyone how we can be so critical to achieving these absolutely critical goals that are so fundamentally aligned to our values. Thank you, Masood. Andrew. Yeah, I, I just wanted to pick up on, on what Masood said because I think it, it's reflecting on the, the, the day-long institute that we held around the SDGs, I think the participants left the day thinking of themselves as advocates, if not leaders, uh, on the SDG space at their own institutions, or if they weren't leaders and they were ambassadors for the library's role in institutional effort that was already being undertaken, right? So I think they sort of made that connection. You know, librarians, we, we, you know, we have a tendency to rush in where angels fear to tread <laughs> often when there, when there are new things going on. But I think the difference here um, that makes this leadership instead of just blind advocacy, um, you know, is the it, it, having the education and tools that we need to sort of to to participate uh, thoughtfully and intentionally um, in these things, and and not just sort of you know standing in a corner and screaming SDGs, SDGs, you know, climate change, climate change. Um, you know, you know, having those tools makes the libraries into leaders uh, in their institutions around these around these areas. Thank you, Andrew. Palma, did you want to come in? Um, I was uh, going to do a shameless plug for um, those that uh, that Open Education Collective um, that Australia has um, managed to do, and we really did surprise ourselves very much. Um, it, we thought that we might get uh, ten institutions who wanted to publish um, an open textbook. Um, uh, and and basically the the idea was and is that we have a collective. Um, people pay a very small amount to get access to an open publishing platform. Um, they get training on how to work with academics around creating open textbooks for the Australian higher education curriculum. Um, uh, we developed workflows and. Um, uh, some courses and and uh, held um, have several communities communities of practice. But what we've ended up is is almost every single Australian and New Zealand li university library is a member of that collective now, and there are dozens and dozens of books being produced, and they're all collaborative books. And one of the and they're all. Um, uh, digital and they're accessible in different formats um, and there's a lot of collaboration between and across universities um, in areas of the curriculum where they would not necessarily have been that level of collaboration before um, and I think it's one of those things where you can really see that this can make a huge difference to 
students' lives and the ability of people who don't think that they belong in, in university or could afford a university education to not have that bill shock when they arrive and see the cost of the ridiculous cost of textbooks that they would use for one semester and perhaps not again. Um, so I think that's a that's a real leadership that we can we've we've got the expertise and the ability and the and the um, connections to make that happen and um, so we're I'm hoping that that's a thing that other uh, uh, countries might be interested in but of course uh, we also we don't just create new texts we look at texts that might come from North America or the UK or whatever and then put that uh, Australian perspective in and then we can not localize them even more so for instance here at the University of Southern Queensland we've taken a, a, a text uh, put some local uh, First Nations perspectives into that text and then James Cook University which is in North Queensland has put its own uh, First Nations perspective from from that the, those areas um, uh, perspective into the same text and made that uh, contextualised for them. And that's a really good example of how you can um, uh, localise and globalise at the same time. And I think this is what the SDGs is trying to get us to do is local uh, action, but make it collaborative and make it uh, have a global impact. And I think there's there's quite a lot, I think, that libraries can do in terms of what can we do collectively that can uh, just spread that local initiative far and wide. Yeah, yeah, Carmel, well, before I bring my Susan, I just want to ask you a quick question that's come up, which is, um, is the is the OER collective incentivized for academics to generate or create this? Uh, yes, we have some grants. So we do give very small grants out to academics, but many of the many of the publications aren't particularly grant based either. So um, in our own institution, we give some grants in addition, um, but collectively we might give maybe. 30 grants a year, I think, but don't quote me on that though. Um, but very, quite small, so they're really to pay for a research assistant or a bit of teaching buyout, but not very, not to, not a huge amount of money being in that ecosystem to achieve quite a lot. Okay, thank you. Matsu. Yeah, I think as Carmen was speaking, I just a thought that came to my mind. This is particularly with the open access for monocross initiative here in the UK and the importance of university presses in there. And one thing that um, I was going to take back, but also hopefully might also instigate others to take back from this, is actually before we even ask our suppliers what their plans are, we should start with ourselves. What is our own uh, university press infrastructure carbon footprint? What are we doing around that and how are we supporting that? Uh, in the long term. So I think there's a, a thought to take back about as we progress on those open infrastructures, we should also absolutely be critical about uh, what kind of sustainability elements that we need to incorporate in development of those. Okay, so on that, before we move on to our final section, I just wanted to lob something in, a question that somebody's been, and I know Masood, you and I have spoken about this, which is, is our work with SDGs and, and in particular the sustainability goal compatible with um, uh, libraries explorations of AI uh, where these technologies are increasingly seen to be using significant amounts of energy and water. Um, and I know Masood you will have a comment on it because we've spoken about it. Is there anybody else that would like to comment on that? This is AI. I'll, I'll say something. I, you know, I think um, I was trying to find the link to, for something that I wanted to share uh, in a previous role. Uh, uh, my organization had commissioned a, a gentleman named Thomas Padilla to explore. This was a, a couple of years before the AI explosion. This was published in 2019. Um, the, the, the role of machine learning, data science and artificial intelligence in libraries. Right, and we, and we were really looking for something that was about the practice, you know, the 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 applied research of building tools and and things like that. Um, but 
he he interviewed um, you know several dozen people about this, and the theme that emerged from this was something that became the main title for the report, which was responsible operations. Right, that the the thing that we need to sort of do differently, you know, uh, as I, as I like to say, while you know corporations plunder and governments flounder around artificial intelligence, the role in higher education is that responsible operation uh, sort of area. What does this mean for the scholarly record? Um, what it, what does this mean for sustainability? You know, are we acting responsibly in our own organizations when we build large language models? Uh, and things like that. Um, and, and what are we doing to sort of inform our patrons, our users, um, about the other tools, the other sort of more corporately driven tools that they're using uh, around, you know, the sort of um, uh, data intelligence, uh, you know, um, uh, bibli what we used to call bibliographic instruction. <laughs> you know, are, are we instructing people uh, with, with data literacy around those things? So, um, I think it's a it's a huge intersection. Yeah, I would agree definitely. As well. Yes, that that is the that's the report. Thank you, uh, Masood, for for putting the link in there. Thanks, So I'm going to sort of veer a little away from AI and just look at the question that was just asked by Andy about true carbon footprint and um, the use of the cloud. And I think this is an area where um, libraries could be doing more in identifying where both expenses in carbon and savings in carbon are happening. So in Canada, we're currently, we have a shared repository for data, um, a national shared repository for data. We're looking at the same thing for uh, institutional repositories. Yes, those shared spaces will consume more carbon, but what we haven't done is looked at how much carbon, less carbon my library is now going to produce because I will be using that shared infrastructure. And I think it's not a it's not a zero sum game in some of these cases. And what we do need to look up at and be better able to discuss is where are we making savings and where are we making um, impacts because of that collective work together. So yes, certainly uh, where our institutional repository nationally ends up residing will use more carbon than because it hadn't existed before, but all of the universities who are using it will see a reduction in carbon use, um, both in terms of the physical infrastructure and also um, the less tangible things like electricity, water, and those kinds of things. And so I think we also need to be looking very closely at how those things are balanced. And I don't think we're doing a very good job of that right now. It's it's difficult to do that. I'm, you know, I'm not blaming us. I'm not saying that we've missed the boat. I'm just saying we just need to get better at identifying where those things are so that we can truly, as Andy has indicated, determine what the value is and where we should be making that investment and where we're making the biggest impact. So I just wanted to add that. Thank you for it. Masu. Yeah, I'll be brief about the AI bit um, because people have heard me talk about it before, but um, I think we need to look at it from a tactical perspective and a strategic perspective. Um, yes, the large language models as they currently exist are extremely expensive to run and extremely carbon intensive, but they're also not the future. They, what they are doing is they're showcasing what's possible rather than what would become the norm. And I think Torsten was mentioning this in his keynote yesterday that if University of Chicago was to build a large language model, not even at the scale, the, the daily cost was about $1.5 million. And that is just not sustainable. The, the future on that, at least at a tactical level, would be uh, small scale models that incorporate the same large language uh, capabilities behind them. And they can be run on a single GPU, on a single machine. and they are far more feasible for libraries to be involved in, to be able to experiment with. However, I think when we look at this from a strategic layer, we also need to think about what capabilities does this bring, which actually gets rid of some of the other things that are generating lots of carbon. So for example, it's very, very easy to misunderstand that actually the carbon footprint of a building is far greater than the carbon footprint of a machine running for 50 years, for example. So actually, if we can somehow reduce the amount of physical infrastructure that we have. And sometimes destruction is also not good because that has its own carbon impact. Um, by storing something in a different way that can then be accessed in a different way, in a more intelligent way, that might actually help reduce the carbon footprint for something that's already quite high. 
So I think we need to think about it from a more holistic ecosystem perspective rather than what this algorithm or this current technology is doing. I think, yes, absolutely, the current model is not sustainable, shouldn't be that way, but it generates the potential of us being able to reduce the carbon or reduce the climate impact of many, many other things by rethinking everything differently around that. Thank you, Masood. And thanks for your comments. Um, okay, so last 10 minutes, let's move on to what we might do together um, and to deepen our engagement. So recognizing that you'll all note that our panel comes from the Global North, um, from, from Global North Association. So how do we um, engage more widely and collaboratively to ensure that our work has global benefit? Carmel, do you want to start? Well, I'm from the South. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I don't think that I am the, um, that uh, that Australia is the library association that we're um, targeting with this provocation. Um, I think, you know, the short answer is that knowledge equity and open access uh, is one of the ways that we can assure, ensure that there's, global benefit to what we're doing beyond our borders. But I also think it's important to think about um, uh, that globalization as more partnership and less charity. Um, uh, so think about working with uh, a broader range of, of library associations and libraries in different places rather than sharing what we do with those people, if you know what I mean. Um, uh, and I loved uh, Masood's idea about an international project around values um, and SDGs. Um, okay, thank you. Thank you. So I, I was just going to add, I guess, one of the things that I've learned in um, the last six months uh, is, 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 is what SDGs offer us in terms of a common language, a common framework, common terminology to be able to work together. We we also have published uh, our, a, a series of open textbooks, one of which was um, a, a, a book around the SDGs, which used the theme of the SDGs for English language teaching. Um, so that, you know, that, that, that common thread that everyone can pick up and the, and the, and the common terms um, which will, I think, enable us and help us work more collaboratively together and to coordinate and amplify what we do as, as libraries. Um, so the work around joint, joint campaigns across our associations and across our libraries and our stories um, should should the SDG should should help us with this because of the because of the language. Um, and, and and as Masood said, you know the the idea of us of putting together some projects, cultural exchange programs around the SDGs, um, is 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 very achievable, I think. Um, uh, uh, and 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 there will be far fewer barriers to and to to understanding um, what is needed uh, because of this common language that that we use and these common themes. Andrew. Yeah, I, I didn't want to waste the opportunity when I had 100 people in the room to sort of ask. Everybody was leaving with an idea of what they were going to do with their individual institutions. So I had Henry ask the, the group, what would you want ARL to do? What, you know, what, can, what should ARL be doing that you can't do um, individually? And uh, I mean, this is it, it was a longer discussion, but here's the very, very short <laughs> um, uh, list of things that, that came out of that conversation. Um, they want continued engagement, right? So they they didn't they didn't want to lose momentum on the conversation. They wanted some structure. I think they wanted somebody with some agency, right? That could sort of you know structure those conversations. They want um, collaborative platforms um, to discuss these things. You know that's that's why I threw out that sustainable libraries initiative. I think that's an example of that. They wanted matchmaking. Yeah, you know, what we were calling matchmaking. They wanted you know someone who could connect two members. Who were working in an area um, and and maybe weren't aware of each other. They wanted coalition building. Um, they wanted connection with other associations. So we talked about IARLA, uh, right? And and of course they wanted funding. <laughs> um, I think that was sort of the the elephant in the room of that conversation was you know where where do the resources come from? 
to sustain um, this conversation uh, around uh, SDGs. Thank you, Andrew. Anyone else? Um, I would just like to pick up on what Carmel said, actually, about looking at it as partnerships and not charity. Uh, and I think this is really critical. So in Canada, there is also um, strong open publishing networks, um, either at a provincial level or uh, not so much nationally, but at a provincial level, but we've shared things across the country. But what we've actually found is that some of our French language texts have far more impact in Africa than our English language texts, because they're in the language that those people speak. And so I think one of the things, you know, we can pat ourselves on our back and say, yes, we've made all of these things available, but if we're not engaging with communities locally and saying, does this actually meet your need? Um, we're not doing, we're not going as far as the SDGs um, expect us to. And so in some cases, um, you know, here in uh, Saskatchewan, we have been doing texts in local Indigenous languages. Those languages um, will not translate across the world, but what we can do is then work with other groups um, worldwide to ensure that those kinds, of, that kind of information is uh, translated into local Indigenous languages using the structures that we've been able to develop here. Um, and I think that's really that vision that the SDGs have of an interconnected, and as Masood said earlier, a holistic world um, where we're supporting each other as opposed to people relying on the beneficence of others to sort of deliver something to them. And I think there's a really great opportunity for libraries to take a leadership role in this area uh, because we are used to working collaboratively. We are used to working uh, internationally. And I think that there's real opportunities for us to expand the reach of the work that we're doing in partnership, as Carmel said, with uh, local libraries um, worldwide. And I think there's a real opportunity that we, we need to capitalize. Yeah, local, global, Masood. Just very briefly, I think we need to add intentionality to this. I think uh, what we need to do, just picking up on that absolutely brilliant point from Brett, I think we, we've, we've talked about, we need to do something about it, but we need to be really intentional about it and say, okay, who are our partners in this? Who wants to work with us on this one? And I think the, the initial platform for that could be ILA, and then we look beyond that afterwards. Yeah, 